Hello, traders. Uh, we have a special guest uh, I'm a little insecure about because I just told Santiago Velez that uh, the only kind of wallet I know is made out of leather. So, you know, uh, wallet in today's terms means, you know, storage. So, San Diego, uh, great to have you. Thank you for granting the interview. Oh, it's an absolute pleasure. I've been a huge fan of you and your work for a long time. So, uh, wow. very honored to be here. Thank you. Uh, it's really uh, humbling when I talk to people and, you know, they're aware of me. I guess, you know, after seven, eight years of thousands of interviews, <laughs> you know, people can't help but run across it. So, what's interesting to me Santiago, before we get into what you do and start talking crypto, is first of all, when did you know you wanted to be a nuclear engineer? Oh, that's a tough. I mean, I when I was a when I was a child, I always kind of had questions about how the universe worked and why things are the way they are, and that just lent itself naturally to uh, a th science and engineering background. And so, okay. I, I would guess probably. Uh, middle school when I really started to explore nuclear power and energy and I'm an environmentalist so I believe strongly in a, a, a clean environment and I believe nuclear power is kind of the best I was going to ask you that yeah you know, I mean uh, uranium's been on a tremendous bull run uh, you know I've talked to people about it the the spot market is like not much of a market is it I mean there's nothing between bids and offers sometimes they post a price and nothing traded so you know, the, the thing I, 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 I'm most excited about that market is uh, there's been such a lag in development of new mines and new infrastructure. Yeah. And now the demand looks like it's going to be rising globally precipitously. And yeah. that disconnect between those that supply chain and the demand is is going to lead to only one way for price. So yeah. I'm super excited about uranium, to be honest. Okay. So it's, you know, uh you know, a lot of people feel like, you know, they've seen a lot of the equities double, triple, and uh, they feel late. What inning are we in? For equities? Uh, for, we're, for, we're, 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 <laughs> for, for uranium equities, yeah. Oh, oh for uranium. Okay, well, um, I, I do subscribe to the idea that we'll probably get a, a fairly large co a correction in equities writ large, just across the board and that'll take all the babies they'll throw the babies yeah. out with the bath water. definitely definitely i believe that okay. but I, that that's where opportunity is going to reside and that's kind of what i'm waiting for to take a big position in, in the commodity sector is is after that large what production. a run in miners huh i think so they, i they, mean they were declared dead silver and gold miners uh, only right. a month and a half ago gold and silver are sniffing something out um, you know, about the economy. I, I don't think yeah. there's any way to deny it. There, there are concerns about inflation and, and, yeah. and the way the Fed's managing things and the gold market's right on top of that. So yeah, it's no surprise. Yields, yeah, even on a day like this, you know how it's it's really been all one market. Everything's going up together. Everything's uh, compressing together. And today's number, new high in yields, finally had some impact on the dollar, which drove the metals down. But they're fighting their way back already. You could tell a bull market that when, mm -hmm. uh, you know, they're still buying the first dip, the first good down day they're in. Yeah. So anyway, uh, so let's now move from, and as a nuclear engineer, uh, the, uh, Alexis said, uh, did you work on like rockets or what oh, were no, you doing? I no, I, I was all primarily in the U.S. commercial nuclear power sector. Uh, so I that see. involved okay. um, operating nuclear reactors to okay. optimize output, uh, managing nuclear fuel, you know, uh, all the way through this life cycle. So like before it is uh, pulled out of the ground in Australia or Kazakhstan or somewhere through made into a fuel bundle to put into a nuclear reactor operating it so that you get all the energy out safely and then once it's taken out it's highly radioactive you have to put it in these long-term underground uh yeah. pools of water and then from there they put them in these casks that yeah. can go into a mountain so that yeah. whole life cycle i managed aspects of it throughout my career yeah i, I hope no one's building uh you know a house off the grid <laughs> over some of the <laughs> 
<laughs> I, I would nuclear mind. waste sites, huh? Yeah, you know, you I, I, you could go up to one of these casks and touch it with your bare hand. It's that safe, and I, wow. I have on many occasions. So it's okay. Uh, yeah, cool. uh, 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 you know that. Uh, you know, I'm always uh, looking for the bomb to drop, Sandy. I know. <laughs> so, uh, anyway, um, so now let's talk about the transition from nuclear engineer to crypto trader. And I, I'm from our prior just a few minutes of talking. I said I may I'm mainly in legacy markets, and you said that's great. So uh, now I'm thinking you you trade whatever moves wherever the opportunities are, and you're not uh, pigeonholed in just crypto. Absolutely. But, yeah. But how, so tell us how you became a trader. Well, I, I uh, first of all, I, I, I didn't understand money. I didn't understand finance, even though I was an engineer, highly educated, college educated, uh, career professional. I really didn't understand money uh, to the extent that I didn't take responsibility for my investment decisions. Most of my adult life, I had a kind of set and forget 401k, you yeah. know, and you're, you're just typical worker bee type mentality. Um, and it was ironically crypto that made me challenge a lot of the assumptions around what money is and what value is um, and what price is and the differences. New, new paradigm. Yeah. For, I went down this deep rabbit hole. I didn't understand the basis. I didn't even know what the Federal Reserve was. Um, and we, uh, we still, <laughs> many, many people still don't. No, it's just a monster from J Jekyll Island. Right? So <laughs> yeah, that's, <laughs> yeah, that's where they moved from to so DC. Go ahead. I, I just got down this rabbit hole. Um, and yeah. I and it challenged me to understand at a fundamental level, like I had done in my engineering career, what these things are and how they work and to break yeah. that, break that apart. And and I started doing that for my investments. I started doing that for my career. And I said, I, I'm not really interested in nuclear engineering anymore. I'd rather do something related to this new space in finance, which is is crypto, uh, but to to know how to deal with crypto, crypto is still a tick on the dog, as as far as traditional markets, right? It's so okay. small in market cap, um, and it's so dependent on the fiat system of dollars and euros and yens, et cetera, that you need to understand the broad or macro uh, to really understand crypto itself and how it moves and ebbs uh, in price. And that whole realization took me years to figure out. It was a next college education for me. And I, and I took it very seriously to, unlearn, to learn those things. And okay. trading and technical analysis is one small part of that, along with macro views. And then, of course, the understanding the technology, how it works. So I tried to uh, uh, be a broad practitioner, if, I, if you will. Okay. Yeah, yeah. That, that's interesting. And uh, you bring up technical analysis being a small part. So you're kind of a really uh, a fundamentalist for having your narrative and and liking what the project is, that it has uh, staying power, growth potential, et cetera. And then your TA is for being tactical about your narrative. Perfectly uh, is that, said. Is that correct? So yeah. uh, I'm by no you... means a day trader, and I would be terrible at it because I lack yeah. kind of the discipline to to do it along with all the other things I do. So I, you're absolutely right. Okay. So um, some people have mentors or have read books that were influential to them for finding something, you know, there's a million ways to skin a cat. I'm known for these three drive reversals and my RSI work. Okay. So that's my edge. Uh, any books or people influence you uh, while you were learning TA or are you self-taught? Um, I did take a few online courses in TA from people that I respect that have programs. Okay. Um, but honestly, and it's embarrassing to say, the the kind of uh, zeitgeist of Twitter was my school, meaning, you know, the, there's this weird intersection of crypto finance and traditional finance and Twitter that just exposes you to all these kinds of people and their ideas and yeah. if I find somebody that I see is super interesting, I'll go down their rabbit hole for a while and try to learn as much as I can from them. So it's very broad. So I wouldn't point to an individual that okay. inspired me to do this. It was just like this whole exposure to this new world of people. And I haven't looked back. It's I just got sucked in. Yeah, you know, as much as people uh, down talk Twitter and uh, especially with the takeover, 
Uh, it's really been a great resource for you for finding uh, people with different, because, you know, everyone has, there's a million ways to skin a cat. For me, uh, for finding candidates to be interviewed. Hmm. For the last seven years, I would say, you know, 90% of them come off an invite from me on Twitter, on X. So uh, I think it really serves the financial community in in a great way. I mean, some of the, you know, the junk about, um, you know, conspiracy theories and hate and, you know, people, you know, following you around and waiting <laughs> for you to be wrong. <laughs> they don't have to wait too long when they follow me. Uh, anyway, so... All right, let's dig into uh, some of the things that went down your stream. And, you know, one thing really interested me, not that I am ever was or maybe wanted to be a made man, but uh, tell us about the crypto mafia. <laughs> <laughs> tell us about those guys. Well, Who are they? Well, I, I would guess in any market, there's always the early entrance the people okay. who got there first and the insiders, the one who knows most about what's going on. Uh, and I would guess that they tend to drive a lot of the narrative, which drives a lot of the sentiment and, and purchase habits. Right. Uh, and yeah. I'm still, I'm still more biased towards technical signals than narrative, but I definitely recognize the importance of narrative on short-term moves. So I do think there is a cabal of insiders in crypto who just disproportionately control a lot of the narrative and a lot of the value. Uh, and you just have to be prepared to go on those wild rides. You know, they drive yeah. it. Uh, and there's algorithms too. There's incredible yeah. bots for arbitrage and things like that. Um, yeah. So you'd have to be a fool to think it's just a perfectly free and transparent market and that, you know, you're immune from those effects. I mean, we see that in the bigger markets, which have yeah. far more volumes and liquidity, and they're able to move markets sometimes. So in, the, in something as small as crypto, uh, it, it's way easier. So you go for on some wild rides. Yeah, you know, I've had traders say it's the most reflexive market mm -hmm. out there because when the moves happen, they're just, you know, it's not a grind. No. Usually not a grind. Uh, and I also heard um, from Chris Carolyn that I interviewed about uh, the upcoming eclipse when it was upcoming, and he has pinned on his X account that um, crypto is the purest form of expression of fear and greed out of any other market. And something like, you know, one of his books he wrote in 2018 talked about this and it's still that way. It's, you know, it's a pinned tweet from 2018. You, you don't leave a four year pinned tweet up there unless, you know, there's some validity to it. So, uh, you find it uh, the same way? It's, huh. uh, it, I, well, first of all, it's from an asset class perspective, it's the only genuinely global asset class, meaning that the issuance, the trading, uh, the custody is distributed all over the world, right? Like, for example, Bitcoin, it's there's over 100 pretty liquid exchanges around the world. So what is the true price of Bitcoin, right? You'll get a different order book on every exchange, right? And so you rely on arbitragers and, and bots to make that price gap close pretty rapidly. Um, but that really sets true price because you have all these order books that are, you know, guy in Vietnam, a guy in Canada, a guy in the United States, and they're all pushing against each other. And it's a really good expression of true price. But that also means that it represents global sentiment and that sentiment goes in waves, you know, around the globe. And there used to be periods of time where, you know, you'd wake up uh, in the morning on the East coast of the U S and you'd be looking for the kimchi premium from Korea or, you know, the Japanese are, are going to bed and, and certain trades happen at certain hours. And it, it, it's that kind of 24 seven market. So it's, it's very unique in that way. You know, you can only yeah, buy yeah. Apple stock in one exchange, right? So Right, right. And there and there used to be in stocks gaps, which was a big part. It's a big part of technical analysis. It's kind of a lost art because of the 24-6, 24-7 trading. Um, you know, you don't see those gaps. And they used to give great messages. Anyway, uh, back to the 21st century. <laughs> uh, you know, tell me about these exchanges like 
do you feel comfortable where you're trading to leave large cash deposits? No way. Absolutely not. Um, and that's something we should have all learned. You should check out TradeView. <laughs> unless you're in the U.S. But um, yeah, you know, they're regulated. Aren't most of these uh, firms not regulated? In crypto, yeah, most of them are not regulated. And yeah. that's that's one of the main problems for me is that I don't leave either large cash balances or large digital asset balances on those exchange. We learned from FTX yeah. that when you have a counterparty that custodies what is a bearer instrument, that, that's one thing people should know about crypto. It's kind of like having a piece of gold in your possession, right? It's a bearer instrument. Um, when you have a large counterparty like an exchange, accumulate other people's bearer instruments, there's opacity that enters that and there are incentives yeah. that cause bad behavior um, yeah. in a way that in a regulated market with brokers, they, they can't really do. And so- uh, uh, Yeah, uh, you know, you just remind, I'm sorry. I oh, no problem. It's a, it's a you know bad habit. There are now again, um, ads out there talking about earning a yield on your- crypto and uh, that was the beginning of the problems last time um do you think that adds risk to the the whole uh crypto landscape or bitcoin landscape again if there's a large counterparty who is creating a honeypot of incentive they're saying hey give us something of value and then we'll give you some yield on that what are they doing with that yeah. How do they earn that yield? Where do they? We see a lot of this happen with stable, called stable coin providers. These are people who will issue you a one dollar token in exchange for a one dollar deposit, but then they offer some yield on top of that. Well, where does that come from? Well, they must be accumulating duration risk bond, you know, with bonds. It's not FDIC yeah. insured. Uh, right. What what bank is it deposited in, and what if they're Silicon Valley Bank and they go under? What happens to your money? Where where do you re reside on the stack of creditors? Pretty low, yeah. if at all. So yeah. there's a lot of risk there. So the small yield, really, you're 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 picking up pennies in front of a steamroller, right? Um, in oh, crypto, yeah. that's, that's not how you... that's option writing. <laughs> you, you're not. <laughs> it you're sounds not... like you've seen it before. Where like right now. You know, for years, people are making a ton of money selling volatility, right? Yeah. I mean, uh, the recency bias is so well enforced by now that, um, you know, Correct. Correct. there will be a steamroller. Definitely. You know, I, I think it's it's starting now. But, okay. you know, this, this isn't the end of it. I think we just, we were due for a correction. Uh, is that your take on the market here? Just yeah, definitely. Correction. Yeah. Look, I mean, and in crypto, you're going for 10x, 20x. Yeah, you're not going for five percent. So, right. to to put a 10 or 20x potential bag for a five percent uh, yield is insane. It doesn't, yeah. from a risk reward perspective, it doesn't make any sense. It's too asymmetric. So, why would you risk custody of something so valuable if that's your view for five yeah. percent return? It doesn't make any sense. My dream entry is uh, 40k. <laughs> uh, anyway, I know it, it's, yeah, I'm glad you left. So, uh, why don't we talk about, uh, auto bridging and maybe that has something to do with, um, flare. I know you wanted to talk about flare and the other, in, in fact, it's your choice, auto bridging or debt box ruling. What's more important? Debt box ruling? I don't even know what that is. So I, I oh, want to learn from you. Oh, I, I thought I thought I saw it on your stream. Something about debt box. Uh, you retweet. Maybe you retweeted it. So then, uh, why don't we go to auto oh, bridging? Yeah. Okay. Oh, yeah, do okay. you remember now? What I, I do. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, there's there's always a lot of cases going on in the courts about the regulators yeah. in the U.S. kind of attacking some aspect of crypto. So that was okay. one. But it's there's, there's just a broad attack, I would say, in the U.S. about against crypto, and unfortunately, yeah. it, it, it's affecting our strategic advantage in the world as a financial provider. Uh, and eventually, I think it's going to have to backfire. But I, I don't underestimate the U.S.'s ability to catch up and take over quickly. So yeah. I don't, you know, that could change very quickly. So I, I'm not that worried about it. But Do that, you think CBDCs are coming here? 
Not in the in the near future, no, because um, I think there's pretty broad political consensus that the Federal Reserve issuing a CBDC, especially in retail, like to people like you and I in yeah. currency, is um, not does not align with the U.S. values very well. So there's not very yeah. much political will to allow that. I would yeah. actually prefer the Treasury issue an e-dollar in cash than a Federal Reserve CBDC, and that that's a big difference. And I yeah, think- uh, you know, right. That means that they're taking over the um, the Treasury function. Exactly. Right? Right. They're the bank when that happens. Exactly. The one bank. Why does Europe have uh, more acceptance towards it? What's the difference in values? Well, I, I think because, first of all, I think because they're a, a a conglomerate of different nation states, they have to reconcile at the banking level a lot of interbank and uh, uh, clearing, right? And so for them, it makes sense to issue what they call wholesale CBDC, which is a type of token instrument that each bank can hold in their deposits as a claim on the other banks or on the central bank's reserves. So yeah. for them, it makes sense because you've got all, you know, you got your Italian banking system, right. German banking, and true. then you have your different bond markets. So for them, yeah. wholesale clearing and settlement makes sense with a CBDC. Retail, though, that's a whole different matter. And I think there's going to be a battle in Europe uh, around retail and what what privacy rights you have and yeah. why, you know, if the central bank's trying to subvert a local government, like the government of Italy or France, what does that mean being a French citizen or Italian citizen if you have a central bank trying to subvert your local uh, monetary policy? So that that's a friction that I'm kind of short the euro over a, the long term precisely because they don't have a unified okay. um, monetary and fiscal policy. It's kind of fractured. So okay. I, I don't see how that stays whole for 20, 30 years from now. Okay, you're looking for it to bust out, like people yeah, but, have said. So sub sub uh, parity is a, a, a layup then for what you're looking for. You're probably like 80, 60 cents before uh, there's a breakup of that monetary union. Yeah, I mean, they, I, can't, I can't imagine the stress if the euro were to just roll Weaken. over. It would be brutal. Uh, and there's enough political stress in Europe as it is. So yeah. we saw that in 2012. There's a war there. 15. Yeah. And, and and remember during the Euro crisis, how bad the, the bailouts looked on the, you know, Portugal, Spain, Greece. It was pretty, a lot of political strife there. And it could get a lot worse. So, Well, what about our banks, Santiago? Yeah. I mean, I, I don't think the regionals, despite this parabolic move in stocks, these uh, like KRE, it looks like it was just a bear market rally and that higher yields could crush him again. I am of the opinion, and this is on my pinned tweet and on Twitter X is uh, uh, I really think that we have this trend of aggregation in the U S banking system where there's such a favoritism towards the globally systemic important banks that it's just a matter of time before all the regionals get just knocked out and economies of scale, the only way you're going to be able to survive, especially in, in certain interest rate environments, and they're just going to get wiped out. And and so I'm very short uh, regional banks in that sense. I, I just okay. don't think that they're going to make it forever. Are Americans' deposits safe with the blanket guarantee by Yellen when she's <laughs> not in office next year? I was surprised last year the FDIC said that with Silicon Valley Bank, they would cover yeah. all deposits. That was yeah. a that was a that was a watershed moment that I was shocked when they did that. Um, and I think that signals to everyone else, like they've gotten rid of that facility now, though. They can always bring it back. Right. I mean, they they can do whatever they want. That's, that's where, where do we reside? I, I, it's, I was very surprised. So FDIC is going to cover everything. (laughs) Okay. Uh, you want to talk about Ethereum maximalism and (laughs) what that means? You're laughing at that too. (laughs) <laughs> uh, i'll tell you what for people who are not in crypto one thing you should understand from the outside looking in is that it's a zoo over here and we each have the our wild own west friends. yeah the wild west we, we we each have our own communities who are evangelists who we go on these holy wars to convince other communities why they're terrible and most importantly convince non-cryptos why we're the best and this is the token you should invest in it's one of the only asset classes where 
the holders of the asset are highly incentivized to convince other people to buy their bag because it's such a, as you said, a reflexive market, right? And yeah. so there are these battles where everyone says, well, my ecosystem is the greatest thing since sliced bread. And this is why you should buy it. And there so people have downlines. What's that? Do people have downlines where, you know, they buy it and they incentive, they tell their friends to buy it and their friends buy it and they, you know, oh. kind of like that movie, dumb money. Oh, it's, where everyone, huh? The, the, the whole community is full of uh, telegram channels yeah. WhatsApp channels, signal channel, you name it, channels in every single social media network venue you could imagine yeah. for people to do these kinds of coordinated trading, yeah. marketing, marketing. Yeah. It's unreal. I've never seen anything like it. You know, um, I'm interested in seeing, uh, I'd like you to share your screen and show us a, a Flare platform. Yeah. So uh, I think the guys from Flare sent me some DMs on uh, X that, uh, there's some kind of crypto <laughs> symbol that you won't do TA on. <laughs> well, I, um, uh, I, is it, are they illiquid ones? Why, why is it? Well, a lot of crypto I'd say below the hundred market cap mark are very illiquid and subject okay. to the kinds of manipulation that we talked about earlier, these large whales and early entrants. Uh, you have to make an appointment for a trade. If you put up a five minute chart, you would see dots. I you 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 will see zigzags in all directions. Uh, okay. it, it's pretty awful, and um, yeah. So I don't re recommend it for the weak of heart. You know, like it, okay. it is it is volatile, uh, but right. that is where your gains are. If you really want to make twenty x in crypto, you've got to go in the, below the one hundred market cap. Wow, At, uh, above you know. It above. reminds me of uh, the pink sheets. Yeah, the, it's like it's like penny stocks. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, very much. Right. But they're globally right. distributed penny stocks. Yeah, that's better. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, you got a larger you... pool of uh, yeah, of yeah. suckers to buy this <laughs> thing, right? <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know. I didn't have, could not have predicted I'd laugh as much during this interview. So, if you want to show the uh, the Flare platform, you go to the bottom of the screen on yep. Zoom, and it'll say Share Screen, and you click that. And uh, you guys built this? Yeah. So uh, after FTX and a, a, a few other huge failures like Celsius, there were a bunch of companies in 2022 and after that failed because of centralized control of their assets, right? And right. We, we, we felt very strongly that was a bad and it reflected badly on crypto. And now SBF is in jail and yeah. it was just a disgrace. So we set out to build something where even we can't, touch people's funds and it's a DeFi related product that means decentralized financial product okay we wanted to get into futures um so that people could speculate or hedge on the price of any number of things that have a valid price signal and i'll, I'll get into what that means um and so we looked at all the networks and crypto and the attributes they had, and we found Flare networks. And what's special about Flare as opposed to other layer ones um, is it has this Oracle system. <clears throat> now, an Oracle from a crypto perspective is how do you get something from the outside world and report its price or a piece of information about it to the network so that you can do something with that information, like a, like a execute a contract, for example. Um, and one of the things we discovered is that most oracles are pretty centralized. And, and by that, I mean that they can be subject to manipulation. So if I go take a position on a, a futures product on a centralized exchange, that exchange can introduce a wick at two in the morning that doesn't even represent true price. It's just this wick that comes in and everyone gets liquidated, right? And then all of a sudden, magically, that wick disappears and price is back to normal. And so that that's that's a that's deeply problematic it's a crime. It's a crime, and that's one of the reasons why regulators are like, you know, a lot of crypto is is has criminal elements to it. And we agreed in that sense that, you know, how can you allow a wick to come in and liquidate whole classes of people and and people take ten x leverage, twenty x leverage, so it doesn't take much. Yeah. Um, and so we built something that we not even we can do that. The builders can't even do that. So nice. we. Yeah, we call it XDeFi. And 
uh, it uses this Oracle system. Let's see it. Yeah, sure. What are you talking about? All right. So click the share share and show the screen it's on. All right. So this XDFI, uh, it's a beta. There's no real money at risk right now. What people can do is just play with it. Um, and this, what you'll notice first here is you've got your typical charts from TradingView, which we embedded the TradingView tools directly into the platform. So people can use what they're comfortable with. But there's this nice. other little thing here. You see this FTSO? Yes. If you'll notice the FTSO is a chart but it's different than trading view, not just in its time horizon, it's much it's zoomed in, right? But this price comes from that Oracle system I was telling you about. So in this case, what I'm showing here is Bitcoin. Um, this isn't the price of Bitcoin for one exchange. This is the price of Bitcoin that resulted from competition over, of over a hundred price oracles around the world. These, these computers are all competing to figure out the true price of Bitcoin. And when the way they do that is they survey all the exchanges and then they make adjustments for the volume on the exchanges and the number of trades and all these other parameters. And they each have their own independent way of figuring out the price of Bitcoin. And then what they do is they submit that price in a blind auction. So none of the other oracles can see each other's price. And then they all submit it and those, you know, let's say those hundred different prices of Bitcoin are in this blind auction are submitted. Then the curtain is pulled back and everybody can see everybody else's price. And then they apply some statistics to it and they eliminate all the outliers. If you're outside of a particular band, you're gone. Yeah. And then if you're within two other bands, you get a reward. And so you're incentivized to basically provide the, the best, best bid price. offer. Give Correct. the best spread. Exactly. And so this competitive process ensures that what you see as a price is reflective of the methods of 100 different uh, competitors and that the ones that are outliers are gone. And Isn't so that kind of how the souls bandits work, work. They saw market makers, best bids and offers. Uh, they had access to that before they had dark pools and stuff. Yeah, maybe. And that's Souls. that's yeah. one of the ways to avoid insider uh, advanced knowledge about price for arbitrage is to use a competitive process. And this is public to everyone in the world. We can all, once it's revealed those prices and the statistics are applied, we can all enjoy this price feed. And so we know this is the best price for Bitcoin anywhere in the world, right? So what's a website address? So right now you can go to xdfi, xdfi.io. And from there, it, you, there, there's a process for how you can even use this. So, um, so first of all, the, the FTSO gives us the best price. We've come to that conclusion. Secondly, um, this is completely decentralized. What that means is that when you deposit funds into this platform to take a position, on long or short on Bitcoin. You don't deposit funds with us, the company that built this. You deposit funds into a smart contract on the Flare network. And that contract is beyond our control to manipulate because once you deploy it, it is on the network. And even if we were to go out of business today, that contract is on the network and it will be on that network until the network stops, right? So that contract is where funds are deposited. And that means that there's no way for us to steal any of the funds. You or anyone else who uses the platform can inspect the contract or you know, get a coder who knows what they're looking at. And they can inspect it and see if there's any way for somebody to steal the funds. And so this is a radical departure from traditional finance where we're used to using brokers or intermediaries. Yeah. We rely right. on brokers and intermediaries to be that neutral party between the buyer and sellers so that we can't steal from each other. But in this case, we're using source code in lieu of a broker or an intermediary. And that's really powerful. Wow. Um, and so, so do we, you keep a majority of your funds in these contracts so you could trade this stuff? So in my personal funds, if I wanna make a trade, I would by far always prefer to use a, what they call a DEX, a decentralized exchange, which is the same principles 
that I'm talking about here. It's trustless, non-custodial. Uh, in this particular case, I use I, I keep my funds on a wallet, my personal wallet, until such time as I want to make a trade because this this network is so fast. I can move it from my wallet to the deposit contract on the platform in three seconds. So there's no real wow. lag. You know, I don't need to worry about having the money. And and the other thing that's really different from traditional finance is, you know, when a position settles, it takes a while, right? Two, three days, sometimes they'll hold on to your money before really? it actually is useful for settlement. I mean, when I use my Fidelity account, for example, and I settle a position, I don't see that money for two days. It just says pending. Right? I can't use it for another trade. And I think there's even rules about how quickly you can settle one trade and move into the other. So there, that this doesn't exist with this. That's going to go away. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, yeah. So, all right. Cutting edge. Definitely, Cutting edge. Santiago. I mean, uh, it, you know, blows my, blows my mind. <laughs> so what technology look you're talking to a guy who's used to carry around a chart book <laughs> that's great it'll uh, still know, work <laughs> and use a pen or a pencil uh, and a ruler and <laughs> things like that so um really a great interview uh, you know uh, what's the most important advice you could give somebody about from your experience as far as being a trader don't get married to your investment. Be asset agnostic. In other words, be open to the possibility that what you came to the conclusion of something being valuable or not could change at any time and be uh, as, as rational as you can. I, I, one of the mistakes I've made in the past is being too married to a particular asset Attached. or a narrative. And yeah. that held, that holds you back from making the right decision at the right time. So that would be my great, advice. great advice. Uh, uh, my my version of it is keep an open mind. It'll keep your account open. <laughs> I like that. You I'm going to steal that. It. You could use it. So I'm, I'm so glad we met and had this talk, San Diego. Really. It's my pleasure. Thank, thank you so much. It was an honor being out here. Yeah, we're going we to talk to talk. We're going to talk again because, you know, uh, laughter gives you a cheerful heart and uh, you're much better off with the cheerful heart. So yes, thanks sir. for doing that and um, edifying our Thank you so TGH much. community and giving them a lot of great ideas. And uh, I wish you only the best on your journey. You know, when you survive an interview with me, you know what happens? <laughs> what? You become my trading warrior brother. <laughs> All right, sounds good. Let's go to All war right. together. Thank All you. right, brother. My brother, San Diego Velez. Check him out. His uh, X handle is a little complicated. I, I don't know if it was a, a, a girlfriend's phone number at one time or something. <laughs> uh, it's uh, Santiago78758327. Oh, what so are those embarrassing. Numbers? I had no I idea. I, I was such huh? a noob when I joined Twitter. I didn't even know how to set my profile properly. And All right. Okay. Anyway, uh, you know, it's kind of like an Einstein, Albert Einstein. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thank you so much, buddy. Take really care. Uh, good hunting. Glad we met. And uh, I'm a fan. Cheers. Take it easy. Good hunting. All right, everyone. Hope you enjoyed Santiago. I did. And remember, don't just count your pips, count your blessings or your contracts or your crypto. And, uh, you know, be grateful. So that's a wrap. Um, Mike and I will see you tomorrow. Adios. Thanks again, buddy. You're welcome. Thank you. This was great. Was I, I really enjoyed this. Yeah, it was fun. It's good <laughs> to have fun and, and also give compelling stuff, you know. So you keep it interesting too. Like you move around, you hop around a lot. It's like, yeah. whoa, that's good. Good question. I don't script anything. That's great. <laughs>